Hello, welcome to the Reykjavik News Desk. I'm Andy Sophia Fontaine, and these are the weekend's top stories in Iceland. If you like the content you see here, be sure to like and subscribe. And if you really like the content you see here, check out the Patreon link in the description below. And now, the weekend's top stories. Vise reports that Agnus Sigurjonsson, who is described as a defense expert, has published a book called The Icelandic Army. In this book, he argues that Iceland needs a military. Now, this is not a new idea. Former Minister of Justice Björnsson very famously supported the idea of Iceland getting its own military. Now, the current Minister of Foreign Affairs, Thordis Koblun Grekvir Gildodotir, has pointed out that Iceland has a defense agreement with the United States and NATO. In case you didn't know, the United States did have a naval base in Iceland until 2006, after which point it was decommissioned. However, the defense agreement with the U.S. still exists, and NATO also defends Iceland, as Iceland was a founding member of NATO and contributes money to NATO regularly. So that's why you might be here sometimes and see fighter jets flying around. That's not the Icelandic Air Force. That's usually Italy or Norway or somebody like this. For the record, Agnod is listed on the Foreign Ministry's webpage as the Defense Advisor to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He also used to be an officer in the Norwegian Army and was a colonel in the Iceland Crisis Response Unit, or the ICRU. What's the ICRU, you ask? Well, that's what comes closest to being our military. There's some 200 people on the roster, with only about 30 on active duty at any given time. They engage in humanitarian missions and peacekeeping, and as of 2008, haven't even used uniforms or weapons, except in special circumstances. They've been involved in missions around the planet, however, such as in Kosovo, and they were also in Afghanistan during Operation Enduring Freedom, also known as the U.S.-led invasion of Afghanistan. Yes, that's right. Iceland was in the Coalition of the Willing, if you remember that term. How did Iceland get in the Coalition of the Willing without even having a standing military? Well, it was a decision that wasn't made by the Icelandic people, and it certainly wasn't even made in Parliament. This was a decision made by exactly two people, and that will be a subject of another video. Iceland also has a Coast Guard, consisting of three ships and four aircraft, some of which are lightly armed, so we can you know, stave off an invasion if need be, at a moment's notice, if the U.S. and NATO can't get here fast enough. Funny enough, the Pentagon actually did an assessment in 2014 of the feasibility of an invasion of Iceland. And I just want to read one passage from this here, because I think it's hilarious. Quote, the capital and major port at Reykjavik and the NATO naval station at Keplavik are situated on a relatively low-lying peninsula. The lava flows that created the peninsula, however, have left such an uneven surface that it is difficult to walk on, let alone jump onto without breaking a leg. Furthermore, strong winds on the island would make it difficult to parachute onto the relatively small areas that are suitable, end quote. The report also points out that there's like a bunch of sandbars and reefs all around Iceland, which would make a water landing pretty difficult too. So maybe the best defense that we have against a foreign invasion is the country itself. Who knows? Either way, it's not something we're going to have to worry about all that much, I don't think. And in any event, we do have NATO and the U.S. backing us up for now. Moving on. Ruv reports that the parliamentary ombudsman, Skuli Magnusson, has sent a formal request to Minister of Finance, Bjarni Benediksson, asking him how and in which ways the rules and administrative laws were abided by during the sale of 22.5% of East Landsbanki's shares to private parties. Just for some background, East Landsbanki was taken over by the government in 2008 following the financial crash of the country, and it has been owned by the government ever since. However, certain parties, especially the Independence Party, have been very keen on privatizing the banks Again, even though it's arguably the privatization of the banks in the early 2000s, which led to the financial crash to begin with, putting all that aside, the Independence Party has been very keen to privatize the banks again. And so, in March 2022, 22.5% of East Lansbanki shares were put up for sale. Amongst the buyers of some of these shares was a company called Hofsilver AHF. This company is owned by a man named Sven Benedictsson. Sven Benediksson is father of Minister of Finance Bjarni Benediksson. Naturally, this led to 
um, a lot of people being very upset and saying that this was corruption going on. Yatni Ben swore up and down he had no idea that his dad was involved in this sale, saying that he doesn't talk to his dad very often, which is kind of a funny excuse. However, the law on this is pretty clear, and we actually do have a law on the sale of government assets to private parties, Article 4 of which states the following, quote, When an offer to buy shares is submitted, Icelandic State Financial Investments submits the offer to the Minister of Finance with the re reasoning for the sale. The Minister decides whether the off offer will be accepted or denied and signs the agreement on behalf of the government on the sale of the shares, end quote. What this means is that there are basically two possibilities. Number one, Bjarni Ben saw that the company that his dad owns put in an offer to buy these shares and he signed off on it, or he didn't really read this information very carefully and signed off on it anyway. Either way, it doesn't look really good for him. Ultimately, the Icelandic National Audit Office in their assessment of the bank sales, said that there were numerous errors involved, but Bjarni Ben has maintained his innocence from the very beginning, and that is why the parliamentary ombudsman is now asking him to show his work to the class, as it were, to prove, in fact, that he did follow all the laws and regulations involved in these sales, and how exactly he did so. So we'll see what comes of that. In lighter news, Ruv also reports that Left Green City Council person for Reykjavik City Council, Liv Magneodotir, has submitted a proposal wherein every Reykjavik household would be given a bus card for free that included some rides on it. This bus card is referred to as CLAPP, K-L-A-P-P, -P, um, which is also the name of the app that we use on our phones. It's basically a QR code that you scan on a QR scanner on the bus. And it's a very, um, put it diplomatically, divisive app amongst the bus riders in the greater capital area. Sometimes it doesn't work. Well, oftentimes it doesn't work. And when it does, you just show your phone to the bus driver and they will usually wave you onto the bus anyway, which, funny enough, is what we actually used to do before CLOP was introduced. Leaf is hoping that this move will encourage people to ride the bus more often. And it just might work, considering that when Akureyri made free buses, some years ago, in the early 2000s, they actually saw the bus ridership increase a great deal because they were free now. Visa reports that Icelandic wool is now more popular than ever. So popular, in fact, that as far as sheep farmers are concerned, meat is third in terms of the reasons why they're raising sheep to begin with. This should probably come as no surprise to you if you've ever taken a walk through downtown Reykjavik. You've probably seen plenty of stores offering wool sweaters and hats and gloves made from genuine Icelandic wool. Also, little side note, contrary to popular belief, sheep do not outnumber Icelanders by a factor of two to one or even four to one as I've seen in some places. The official count of sheep in Iceland is just over 400,000. And there's nearly 400,000 Icelanders, so maybe one day the sheep to Icelander ratio will be one to one, but personally my money's on the sheep. Lastly, the East Iceland News Service, Oysterfred, is reporting that police are having a really hard time catching people who go off-roading. Now, if you come to Iceland and you rent a vehicle and you're driving the countryside and you see these pristine black sands, stay on the road. Off-roading is not just illegal, but it's also, it messes up the beauty of the countryside. And in some places, especially where moss grows, it can take decades or even hundreds of years for this moss to grow back. And so, you know, it's just kind of a jerk thing to do, really, is to go off-roading. So if you come here and you rent a vehicle, stay on the roads. Furthermore, if you do go off-roading, the sand can be very unpredictable, and you could find yourself stuck, and then you'd have to call to be rescued and pulled out of there, which is really embarrassing, and then you get slapped with a heavy fine, and then you're all over the Icelandic news, and everyone's pointing and laughing at you. So just bear that in mind. In any event, that's the weekend stories in Iceland. Again, if you like what you see here on the news desk, be sure to like and subscribe, and check out the Patreon link in the description below for what kind of goodies you can get just by kicking a little extra coin our way. On that note, I want to thank Corinne Vasquez and Marion Ward, who subscribe to the Patreon at the $20 level, as well as Stephen Ellis and Vivi Carvalho-Shapner, who subscribed on the $10 level. You'll be getting some 
nice goodies later on this month. Speaking of things coming up this month, the video on the Icelandic political parties will be coming in the next week or two. I promise. I'm really looking forward to doing this. It's, it's something I love geeking out about is politics in Iceland. So look forward to that. In any event, thanks for watching. Be good to each other.